Joshua chapter 6 is where we're going to be. Uh, again, it was, uh, it was a joy to uh, meet uh, Frank Wilfong's two sisters and his brother. We finally, we finally found out uh, what happened to Frank. I, I knew that, um, you know, you could see a scar on his head, and I thought maybe it had, you know, a brain surgery of some kind or something like that, but when he was eight years old, he fell off of a bridge over here at Festus Park, I think. My sister got more of the story than I did. He fell about 20 feet. And it just peeled his skull back. And um, like I say, he was eight, so where's John? John, how old? What year was that? 1965 when that happened. And uh, they told his parents that he would probably not live past being a teenager. And... Um, you know, I, I, told, I told his sisters and brother, I said, you know, your mom got a blessing because mothers in their very nature are nurturing. They love, they raise their children. And I said, um, she took care of Frankie for probably close to 30 years, maybe more than that, after his accident. And then they just got too old to be able to do that. I said, but she got to be his mother, his, you know, taking care of you mother all of those years. And they said it just tore her up to have to let him go and let the state take over his care. Um, but anyway, they both passed away and um, he couldn't have ended up in better hands, I don't think. And uh, so we, they, it wasn't just a nursing home he was in. Uh, he, you know, Frankie was in probably the best place I've ever seen in my life as far as taking care of people. And so anyway, um, you know, all of those years, and he told, he told his mom, he said, Mom, one of these days when I'm in heaven, I'll get to be like everybody else. And I had said this morning, he's better than everybody else. And um, so anyway, uh, tomorrow, the uh, Vineyard Funeral Home, they have a lady that comes and plays an organ for them uh, named Judy Huey. And Judy was my piano teacher when I was a boy. And I know her very well. And, and so I, I asked uh, the guys at Vineyard, I said, is Judy Huey playing the piano tomorrow, playing the organ tomorrow? And they said, uh, yeah. I said, good, because I'm going to ask the family if I can sing a song tomorrow, and I'll work it out with her. And so I had one in my mind to sing. It was just, I wasn't sure if I was going to sing it, but I had one going in my mind, and she said, oh, that would be so wonderful. She said, you know, come to think of it, Frankie had a song that he said he wanted sang at his funeral. And I said, what was it? She said, the old rugged cross. And that was the one I had in my mind. I said, it's going to work perfect. I said, in fact, we just sang that song this morning in church. So anyway, uh, it's going to be a good service tomorrow. You know, I didn't ask. I, I didn't ask, but, you know, Frankie, Frankie knew, okay? He sat in this church and heard me preach the gospel. All those years. And um, I've prayed with Frank. I've talked to Frank. And um, I really don't have any doubt that Frankie's in heaven. I don't know about his family. I don't know anything besides that. But I knew that Frankie knew what heaven was. And, I, and he knew that he was going. And he knew that he was going to get a new body. Okay. Am I crooked, John? All right. So anyway, I, I am, you know, like I said, I'm sad, but I'm happy for Frank. I am. And he's lived, he's lived his life in a wheelchair. 
and not supposed to live past 16 years old. He was 65. And I said, doggone it, he could have got Social Security this year. That's a joke. He was on government for all his life. Anyway, Joshua chapter 6. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask God to help us open our eyes. And uh, we're going we're gonna to unlock the scriptures tonight and get the meaning of what God is doing here. Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house tonight. It's good to be with your people. I thank you for them. I thank you, Lord, for their willingness to sit and learn at Jesus' feet. And I pray, dear God, that you would open up your hand wide and feed us. Give us bread from heaven. Lord, help us to not be like Israel. Help us, Lord, to not disdain this light bread that you send down from heaven. Father, we're not asking for flesh. We want, Lord, that manna that comes from heaven. Father, we know that it sustain us. We know that it tastes sweet as honey. We know, Lord, that the word going in us is long-lasting and will do good things, Father, for us. So, Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would feed our souls tonight, that you would open our eyes, that you would benefit us, Lord, with your wisdom, and guide us throughout our lives, Lord, with what we learn from the pages of this wonderful book. I pray that you'd bless it, God, that you would sanctify your word in our midst. Father, that you would bless and magnify your word even above your name tonight. And so, Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would just uh, fill us, Lord, for the week that comes ahead. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, let's read our, our main text. Let's see here. Let me get back to it. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, this is a picture now of things that are going to happen in the future. Now, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war. Go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. I want to look very quickly in, um, in, uh, back in verse 1 again. And the Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. I remember years ago when I first really started studying the scriptures as, as looking at it from the point of Bible prophecy. I was starting to understand the types and the shadows and and how this was a picture of something God was going to do in the last days. And I'll never forget, I had the, when I'm reading verse 1, it just, for some reason, this hit me like a ton of bricks. Because, you know, we've read the Left Behind books, and we've seen all the, you know, the eschatology about how uh, people's going to be raptured, and then it's going to start the seven-year tribulation. And there's going to be people during that time called tribulation saints, they're going to be saved, Without the Bible, without the Holy Spirit, they're going to be saved during this time of the tribulation. And they're going to have to endure and they're going to have to do good works in order to remain saved during this time. And if they make it through to the end, that God will give them salvation. I've always heard that there's going to be people saved during this time. And I'm, I'm like you. I read this and I went, hold on a second. At this time, there is Israel on one side, Jericho on the other. And they're not exchanging team members. I thought about the ark. How God shut up the ark. He closed the door to that ark. No one's going out. No one's coming in. And here with Jericho, by the time when Israel shows up, God shut up the city of Jericho. If you remember, we learned when, when we, we saw God shutting the door of the ark. Jesus is the one who says, I am he that openeth that no man shutteth. I'm he that shutteth and no man openeth. 
And I couldn't get past thinking that there is coming a time when God is going to shut up everything. Those who are on God's side are going to remain on God's side. Those who are on the devil's side, they're going to remain on the devil's side. And at some point, God says, I'm done. I'm closing the door. Not going to leave it open. Not going to give everybody a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, hundredth chance. I'm not going to extend my offer of salvation any longer. I think there's coming a time when God's going to cut it off and say, I'm done. Okay? The ten virgins. That's, Jared, I'm with you, buddy. Five of them go in and the other five are going, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Give us another chance. But when, you're right. When those five went in to the bridegroom, the door was shut. There comes a day when no man can work. My spirit will not always strive with man. And I just think that there's coming a time that if you're not saved, you're not going to be saved. God is going to send strong delusion and everybody's going to believe a lie. Now, some might say, well, what about Rahab the harlot? She's already saved. The two spies have already gone into her and told her, we're coming, the war's going to start, you hang this scarlet cord out there, that'll be the sign. That cord was already in place. She was already saved. She just had to be rescued, alright? But I just think there's coming a time God's going to shut the, uh, the opportunities of salvation off and there are some people who I think, there's even websites up that say, if you read this website after the rapture, let us tell you how things are going to go. And I, I just think that's a waste of... I mean, they have a right to put them up if they want to. I'm just not sure there's going to be anybody that's going to want to read it. If, they, if it's still up. Okay? So anyway, that's just something I'm, I just wanted to share with you. Alright, now, uh, we had mentioned... Uh, last week about the, the idea that Joshua's men marched around the city of Jericho 13 times and they blew 13 trumpets. One time a day for six days. And the seventh day, they marched around seven times and they blew seven trumpets. Now, at some point, we're going we're gonna to go and look at the seven trumpets. Revelation chapter 8 and Revelation chapter 9 and then it kind of extends into chapter 10 and chapter 11. Alright? But I think the, the number 13 when I was studying this it really stuck out in my mind what is the meaning of this? Why is it that they marched around Jericho 13 times exactly? What does that number mean? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. Let's, let's get some understanding here. And what we're going to do is, uh, tonight we're going to answer a question that it's sort, more like an accusation against God. Because there are some people that they'll read the Bible or they'll know a little bit about the Bible and they'll say that God is a murderer. The Christian God and the Jewish God is a murderer. Because God uh, wanted Israel to go in and slaughter all of these innocent men, women, and children. That's how they'll portray it. They'll say the innocent men, women, and children of the uh, promised land, God is a murderer, God sent Joshua in to murder all those people, and they hadn't done anything. That's the accusation that especially a lot of atheists have against God and against the, the Christian God, the God of the Bible. Where we try to tell people that Jesus was, you know, he was the Prince of Peace. And, you know, we want people to know that kind of peace. When he comes to reign, he's gonna, there's going to be a thousand years. There's not going to be any war on planet Earth. No wars anywhere. And right now, there's wars going on all over the world. Well, during this time, there's not going to be a war. And so you try to convince people that God is a good God, that, 
that uh, Christ is going to reign and is going to take war away from the earth. You're going to beat their swords and the plowshares and so on. And they won't believe it because in their minds, God is a murderer God. And God is a warrior God. And, and all God wants is for his people to go out and slaughter everybody that doesn't believe in Jesus. All right? And they, they use this illustration of Jericho that God murdered all these innocent men and women and children. The truth of it is, they of Jericho are not as innocent as what these atheists want people to believe. And something that I understand, something I want to help you with, is that God is God, God is sovereign, and God is the one who judges the nations. And He judges them righteously. He does not make mistakes judging mankind. You know, I look out and I see... People being nice to other people, people being good neighbors. And I say to myself, God, are we really that bad? Is America really that bad? And I think the Holy Ghost responded to me one time. I may be wrong, but I, I felt like the Holy Ghost was saying, Mike, you don't see them the way I see them. I mean, we look on the outside of people. We only see... For, for the most part, we only see what people want us to see about them. We don't know what goes on on the inside of them. I'm doing my trolling through YouTube. And uh, I'm going from one thing to... I was, I've been watching lions and I've been watching flat earth videos and I've been watching pimple popping and all this stuff. And now... There's a show. I'd never really watched this show when it come on, but it's caught my attention. There was a man that was a um, reporter for NBC, and he had a show called To Catch a Predator. And he was catching these men who were chatting online with these 13-year-old girls and boys, but they weren't really chatting with boys and girls. They were chatting with agents, sending dirty pictures to these girls, and then showing up at a house with the idea that they were going to fornicate with these 13-year-old boys and 13-year-old girls. And there would be this guy for NBC News. All of a sudden, he would step out on the scene and he would get these guys. And you know, they were from all walks of life. Mostly, for the most part, they were middle. They will. Uh, they were middle-aged men. They were middle class men. Some of them were school teachers. One was a rabbi. One was a bus driver. One was a doctor. But for the most part, they were men that could live in our neighborhood and on the outside, we wouldn't know them to be predators. But they were. And my feeling is there is a lot more of them out there that are not being caught. So maybe America isn't as good as what we think it is. Maybe there's a lot more sin in America than what you and I can see. I think that might be the case. Amen? And if that's the case then God does have the right. Not only the right, the judicial responsibility to judge this nation on the same equality that he judged Sodom, Gomorrah, Tyre, and Sidon. God judged those nations. God must judge America the same way. Can I hear you say amen? So is God an evil God? Okay, well, let's look at what he says here. We have 13 trumpets, 13 circuits, and so on. What does that mean? In Genesis chapter 13, look at verse 13. 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Someone pointed this out to me. They said, Pastor, there's 13 words in Genesis 13, verse 13. And I went, oh, I missed that. How did I miss that? 
God, why didn't you show me that? God said, I just did. They told you. Okay. I just showed it to you through them. Okay, that's fine, God. Okay. So the number 13 has a meaning attached to it. Okay. And in this case here, it has to do with God's wickedness. Or not God's wickedness. That was the wrong thing to say. Erase that tape. Man's wickedness. Amen. Okay. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And there's a pattern in your Bible. If you'll look at this number 13 in your Bible, there's a pattern in your Bible related to this number. Now, there is another part of this. I want you to notice that as it points out that Sodom and the men of Sodom were very, very wicked and they were wicked exceedingly. Look at what follows that verse. Verse 14. The Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. And I want you to notice that. God separated Abram from Lot. In this case here in Jericho, God separated Joshua and the people of Israel from Jericho and the men of Jericho. They are separated. They are two different types of people in the world. One group is God's people and the other group is all of the other people in the world who are very, very, very wicked. So God said, Lot was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. Four directions. One, two, three, four. That points you to a city built four square. It's New Jerusalem. Okay? For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now Abram is looking in all four of these directions. How far do they go? They go endlessly. God is going to give Abram the entire earth. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if you read Genesis 13, you'll see who was meek in this story. It wasn't Lot. It was Abram. Abram had the right to take the land as it was given to him by God. But because his herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen were striving together, Abram took Lot and he said, Lot, it's not good that, that the heathen are watching us fight. Abram could have said, Lot, I gave you... Your cattle, I gave you the servants, I gave you the grazing land, and this is how you treat me? Why don't you go find your own cattle and get your own servants and go find your own land? But that's not what Abram did. Abram had a right to do it, but he didn't do it. He said, Lot, if you go this way, I'll go that way. Lot, if you choose the south, then I'll go north. Whichever way you go, I'm going to let you pick first. Lot did, took advantage of Abram, did not display meekness. And what did Lot end up with in the end? He lost everything. Because it was destroyed when God destroyed Sodom. Abram then receives the blessing of the inheritance of the entire earth. There is a theme in your Bible that goes like this. Here are the wicked. When God is ready to judge the wicked, He will judge the wicked... And remove them, and then he will give God's people their inheritance. Israel walked into the promised land for what reason? I'm going to show you a scripture here that's going to, in fact, turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy 9. Why did God give that land over to Israel? Was it because Israel was such good people, they deserved it? Did, did God owe it to them? Had they done good works and earned it? No. God tells you why he gives the land over to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4. Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. Now stop right here. You will hear the teachers, such as Joyce Meyer, uh, Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and Creflo Dollar and all of these others, they will tell you and they'll try to teach you that if you do good things and speak positive things, then God owes you a reward for that. That may be true. 
But we don't speak positive things and we don't do righteous things. And the Bible is very clear that even if you spent a whole day being nothing but good, I promise you the next time you sin, God wipes away all that good stuff. You're set now at zero again. So even if you do good things, and God gives you good things as a result of it, you're going to lose it all anyway because you did something stupid the next day. That's what he says in Ezekiel 33. So, don't think that God is blessing you because you did good things for a while. Don't think that. Remember what we learned about Israel this morning. Why did God love Israel? Because he loved Israel. Why did God give Israel such good things? Because he loved them. He didn't give them to them because they were good. He gave them to them because he loved them. He gave them what they didn't deserve, not what they did deserve. Okay? So that's what he's saying here. He said, um, Speak not thou in thine heart. After that, the Lord thy God had cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. And he says, not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go, in, go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Don't think God's giving you this land because he owes it to you because you're good. And God said, you're not good. You're not righteous. You're a bunch of idol-worshiping, hard-headed Jews. The worst of the worst. But I love you. And because I love you, and because I loved Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and because I swore to them, I'm going to fulfill my promise. And because these nations are so wicked and evil... I'm going to drive them out and get them out of this land. They don't have a right to live here. Now watch this. What is the promised land? What is the fulfillment of the promised land? What is it? It's heaven, right? Is there anybody right now living in heaven that does not have the right to be there that God's going to throw them out? Yes. One third of the angels. Okay, they're living in your mansion. They're living in your city. They are possessing your inheritance. And they are evil angels. God is going to use Satan to take his tail and take a third of those angels and cast them down to the earth. And now all of a sudden, there's empty mansions in heaven. Amen, I heard that. I like it when John sits up there and gets happy. At least, he, at least I know he's watching. Okay? God is going to throw them out. And then we are going to go in and live where they lived. We're going to take their place. Just like, the, um, in turn to Deuteronomy 7... Deuteronomy 7, verse 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations from before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Okay? Here's a third of the angelic realm. You can call them the seven heads of the beast. And God is going to take them and cast them out of heaven. And now there's going to be, he's going to free up space. And he's going to call us up and we're going to live where they used to live. And if you read like Deuteronomy and so on, you'll see that God says to Israel, Now, I'm going to send you into a place that when you get there, you're not going to have to build anything. There's going to be houses already built. Cities are already going to be there. When you get there, you're not going to have to build a post office. 
You're not going to have to build a store. You're not going to have to build this. You're not going to have to build that. You're not going to have to build stables and houses. They're already there. Now, the ceilings may be a little high for you, but that's okay. Because I'm going to let you move in. And even then, God told him, he was telling Joshua, he said, when I drive them out, I'm not going to drive all of them out all at once. Because if they all leave all at once, then wild beasts will come in and fill their spots. And God said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it little by little. Now, there's another lesson there. For those of us who are striving to be free from sin. I don't believe that God delivers you all in one day from all of your past sins. I think God does it little by little. Okay, we dealt with this sin today. We got, we got that squared away. Now, tomorrow and for the next couple months, we're go God says, I'm going to deal with this in you, and we're going to drive that one out. Just like Joshua led the armies of Israel one city at a time. They conquered this city. Dwell in it, move on to the next. Conquer that city, dwell in it, rest for a while. Then move on to the next and conquer that city. Does that make sense to everybody? How many of you know that's how God's doing that in your life already? You're not perfect, but are you not better than you were? That's a good sign, that's a good thing. Does everybody understand that so far? Okay, so God is, not, God is a righteous God. He is not... Having Joshua murder innocent men, women, and children. These people are not innocent. If we believe the story of the 12 spies, the giants possessed this land. Many, if not most, if not all of these people were hybrids. Okay? I, now, I don't know to what extent... Okay, But we know that these giants were still around by the time David came on the scene. And that was years after Joshua. Okay, So there's no, we know that uh, Moses fought two giants. Then we know that Joshua killed the rest of them. All right? 33 total. I like that. Okay, 33 total. That's a picture of Christ. Okay, destroying your enemies. All right? But these are not innocent people. They're very, very wicked. All right? Now, take your Bible. We saw what was in Genesis 13. Turn to Exodus 13. Guess what's there? Lo and behold, wicked people. Exodus 13. In Genesis 13, 13, 13 words say, The men of Sodom were uh, wicked before the Lord exceeding. Exodus 13, verse 5, It shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee, a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. Now, in Genesis 13, we saw something. We saw God proclaiming the wickedness of the men of Sodom and using the number 13. And then after that, we see God promising Abraham or Abram that he's going to possess that land. In Exodus 13, we have the same thing. We have God showing the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, Jebusites. And these are the wicked nations that are in that land. And how that God is going to drive them out of that land because of their wickedness. And God is going to allow His people to live inside that land. And this is, and He said, when you get there, you're going to keep the Passover to remember how it was that God brought you here. Well, our Passover is Jesus Christ. And when we get to heaven, we're going to worship the one who was the reason why we got to live in that land. Amen. Turn to Numbers 13. I think we're seeing a pattern. Genesis 13, wicked people in the land. Exodus 13, there's wicked people in the land. Numbers 13, guess what? 
There's wicked people in the land. And we have, let's read it. Numbers 13, verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up, look at there, an evil report. And we're going to see this pattern again. In Deuteronomy 13, we're going to see a warning against following false prophets and false teachers who declare something other than than what God said. An evil report is the opposite of good tidings of great joy. An evil report is the land's full of giants, we cannot go. That's an evil report. It is contrary to the promises of God. The promises of God tell us, yes, you're wicked, but God loves you, He's forgiven all of your sins, and you can dwell in the land flowing with milk and honey where these evil angels used to live. I'm going to kick them out, and you're going to live in their place as God's sons, as sons of God. You're going to live in that land, in that place. That's the good report. The evil report says these people are there, and we can't go. Okay? For the, la the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. Now, see, that's where I'm getting at. Verse 32 says, All the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. That leads me to believe that all of the people that lived there were giants. Hybrids. Okay? Um, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we, and so we were in their sight. So here again, 13th chapter of the book of Numbers is like the 13th chapter of Exodus, which is like the 13th chapter of Genesis. In all of these, now let me ask you this. Why do you think God allowed these men to bring that evil report? Why do you think God allowed them to do that? Anybody want to take a guess? Bingo. No, we're not playing bingo tonight. Next week. All right, but anyway, um, you're exactly right. God allowed these people to come back and, and tell everybody, we're, we can't go, that's all there's. Why don't we just make a captain and go back to Egypt? The shepherd is a separator. The shepherd's going to come one of these days and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are his righteous saints. The goats are the wicked. The same way that he said, God allowed the enemy, Satan, to come in and sow tares in among the wheat. What's the purpose of that? At some point, they're going to grow together, and at some point, it's going to be very, very clear what the tares are, because they're black. And the, now I'm not saying that black people, all black people, are going to be separated out and going to go to hell. Because I'll get accused of that. Okay? But anyway, the wheat are golden like the sun. And he's going to take and he's going to separate the two groups. God, listen to me. God will allow temptation in your life. He's not going to segregate you out and let you be the saint that lived in the plastic bubble. Okay? He's not going to keep you from anything that would tempt you. God allows temptation because he says, I'm going to prove who really are my people and who aren't my people. I'm going to separate them out. It's going to be known who is and who isn't. Because right now, we have a hard time telling. We have a hard time knowing who really is and who really isn't. But I think as time goes on and we get closer to that day, I think it's going to be known who is 
And who is it? They're going to hate us. They're going to separate themselves from us. You can count on that. Okay? But that's the purpose of it. And I'm going to show you that in the very next place that we're going to go to with the pattern of the number 13. Where do you think it might be? Let's see, with Genesis 13, Exodus 13, Numbers 13, Deuteronomy 13. How about we turn there? There it is. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Have you ever had something happen and somebody said to you, maybe that's a sign from God. You ever had that happen before? Or you, something has happened and you've said, maybe, maybe that's a sign from God. You ever had that happen before? Okay. Do you know you're supposed to test that? You're supposed to test the spirits. I'm not saying that God doesn't speak to us and get our attention using signs or wonders. I'm not saying that God doesn't do that. But I'm saying to you that He does not let us sit and try to guess at what it might mean. Remember, um, if I... I, I was talking about this during Sunday school. In the occult, they use symbols a lot. And you can never really get a straight story on what a symbol means. So like tarot cards. Tarot cards don't actually have prophetic words written on them. All they have is a picture of something. So let's say that the tarot card, let's say you pull out the chariot tarot card. There's a tarot card with a chariot on it. And it's got certain symbols on it. Does anybody happen to know what the chariot card means if they pull that on you? Good. You don't need to. Don't study it. Don't waste your time. Okay? But it, it's interesting to me that the card is just a picture. And it's supposed to be a sign of something. But they're not actually telling you what it's a sign of. Y do you see that? Or witches will use a, a pentacle or a pentagram. But they, won't, they don't really know and they won't really tell you what that pentagram really means. It's just a symbol, right? And they say, well, you can, make any, you can take a symbol and make it into anything. That's the point. There's nothing static about it. Whereas, if I read something out of here, I know what John 3.16 means. I know what it means when it says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I know what that means. There's no hidden secret meaning behind the letter codes to it. It means what it says. Amen? That's the difference between our religion and their religion. They speak in symbols and dreams and signs and wonders. And the signs and the wonders come to pass and you think it means something... But see, there's no meaning attached to it. Now they're going to say, the false prophet says, I knew that would happen. Let me tell you what it means. Okay? And the world's going to follow this. Because he's going to say, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. Verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Because he had just told him that in Deuteronomy 6. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be with you. Okay? He's talking about his word. But here, the guy gets, he's a dreamer of dreams. Have you ever had somebody say, oh, I get prophetic dreams all the time. I had, I had a guy one time... He, he wanted to, I told him about a dream I had, and I said, I don't know if it means anything, so I don't tell anybody. He said, well, tell me the dream. So I told him what it was, and he said, oh, oh, I know what, I know what that means. I know what, and I'm going, how in the world do you know that I really dreamed that dream? And then how can you know what all that means? Because a dream is like a movie with no words. And to try to interpret a dream, well, we know that only God can do that. Amen. And he does it how? With his word. 
Okay? So the dreamer of dreams, he's going to give you some dream or some sign or some wonder, and everybody's going to go, wow, that, we know it means something. We don't know what it means. The guy stands up and says, we're going to follow these other gods. And so you know what? There's enough people on this planet, they're going to fall for that. A lot of people already have. They're following after the other gods. And that was easy. And so God says, I sent him. I allowed him to have the dream. I allowed him to prophesy of a vision and that prophecy come to pass. I allowed it to happen and then I allowed him to say, let us go after other gods because God says, we're going to know who's on the Lord's side and who isn't. I sent him there to prove you therewith to see whether or not you actually love the Lord or not. Because if you love the Lord, people, listen, if you love the Lord, you love his book. If you love the Lord, you go by the book and not what some guy says with signs and wonders and dreams and visions. You, go, you follow the book and you follow it to a T. You follow everything that it says. You believe every word that it says. Amen? And some guy says, well, here, oh, God, gave us, God gave us a sign. Surely he did. Let's fought. I mean, here's the Catholic Church, and they believe in all these signs and wonders, so here's a statue of a Virgin Mary with tears coming down its eyes. Oh, that's a sign from God. What does it mean? Worship Mary. See, that's going after other gods. The Catholic Church is full of that nonsense, and you have a billion people all over the world who have fallen for it. And God's saying, I'm going to prove who's on my side and who's not. They've walked away from what I said. Therefore, they are not my people. Amen? So let me finish this out and I'll let you go because I got a lot more 13s. I'm going to give you a homework assignment, all right? Verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and here it is, keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. If you love God, you love his book. And if you don't love God's book, you don't love God. Okay? Verse 5, And that prophet or that dreamer of James shall be put to death, because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. I'm going to bring it down to a close, and I'm going to say this. Jesus said it when he said, Not everyone that crieth, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who attends church 30 years is saved. Not every preacher who preaches behind a pulpit is born again. Not every church is the church of the living God. Not every denomination serves the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of fake, phony, unbelieving church people out there calling themselves Christians. They've been doing it for years. If we're not careful, we'll fall into that same lot. You think it's possible? Let him that standeth take heed, lest he fall. So I don't want to be that. I want the end of my life to be... He believed the Bible every day. That's what I want. That's what I want for this church. That's what I want for this ministry, for those that are watching. Because, God, there is enough false teachings, false prophets, false videos, false internet websites. There is enough false teachers out there that are covering all of the bases of false doctrine. Everything that can be dreamed up is being talked about right now on the internet. And there's some people who said they were saved, said they were Christians, that are now falling for these false teachers and these false prophets. Maybe it's not too late for them to come out. Maybe, maybe God's just going to allow them to get a taste of it and then pull them out like he's done with some of us. Amen? Maybe God will do that. So don't give up on people. Don't be so hasty to write them off as apostates. 
But I'm telling you, there's enough out there to pull away people that don't really believe to begin with. And just like Jared said, the tares and the wheat, they all look the same for a while. But he allows the evil report, he allows the false prophet to separate, to designate who is on the Lord's side and who is not. And it all comes about by way of not what you do, but do you believe what God said? Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Mm-mm. So your homework assignment, I didn't have time to do this last night, is to go through every chapter in the Bible with a 13 on it and see if you find the same pattern. Okay? Is that going to be fun or what? Okay. It'd be easy to do. It comes right after the one with 12 on it. Okay? So you find the 12, the very next chapter is the one you're looking at. All right? Right before the 14 one. Thank you for that. Father in heaven, I love this book. And Lord, it is a, it's a joy when we say, let's study this book. Let's go find something in all the 13 chapters in the Bible. Lord, it's it's not a chore. It's not work. It's a joy. It's a labor of love. Father, you have made this book so unique and so full of treasures. Father, we can find something new every day if we just look long enough. Lord, I thank you, dear God, for opening up this bread to us tonight. Lord, continue to show us great and mighty things that we know not. Lord, you said, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So, Lord, just put it in our hearts this week to knock and to ask and to seek. And, Lord, you'll fill us with good things. Bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.